Does erythritol cause heart attacks? There's a lot of chaos going on out there in social media land and in mainstream media for that matter, and it's all about erythritol. It's due to a study that was published recently in Nature Medicine, a well-respected scientific journal. And that study looked at a, an association of erythritol and cardiac events. As we get into this, there are four things that I want us to consider. Number one, erythritol is a natural molecule that occurs in many of our foods. Number two, your body actually makes erythritol. Number three, erythritol has been mass produced as a healthy alternative to sugar since the 1990s. And number four, there have been many studies, very high quality studies that have shown that erythritol can actually be beneficial to overall cardiovascular health. Many experts who have reviewed this study agree that the paper shows association or correlation but not causation. And that's a very important distinction. Those words mean very different things. The problem is that many people hear the words association or correlation and conclude, well, if it's present, then it must be the cause. As if there's no difference between association and causation. So people in social media and in mainstream media have taken it and run with it saying, erythritol causes heart attacks. <gasps> Pretty scary, right? So let's talk about association and correlation. And the way that I wanna do this is by telling you a story and you're gonna be in it. So one day you decide, hey, I need to go to the grocery store. Let's say you go to your favorite health food store and you're looking for your favorite alternative sweetener. Just as you get to the cashier and you're getting ready to check out, two people come rushing in, they're wearing black, they have masks on, they're waving guns around and they proceed to rob the, the cashier. People are running, people are screaming and fortunately the cashier has a presence of mind to press that little red button, that secret panic button. I don't know if they actually have one of those, but let's Let's just pretend for the sake of the story. They press the button and fortunately for us, and fortunately for you, the police are right across the street. They happen to be at their favorite keto donut shop. And they arrive immediately. They get the signal, they show up, and they are able to arrest the robbers. And everyone's like, yay, justice is being done. And you're standing right there. And the police look at you and say, you're under arrest. And you're like, what? And as this is happening, one of the other police uh, officers is pulling a mask off of one of these and you recognize that person. That person recognizes you. And they're like, hey, and you're like shocked. It's your neighbor. It's one of your friends. The police look at you. You know each other? You're definitely under arrest. This is can be known as guilty by association. So you knew that person. They knew you. You were there. So if you were there, then you must be involved in the robbery. So let's analyze the story just a little bit because it illustrates kind of what this study is showing. So you're thinking, well, just because I'm there doesn't mean that I was involved in the robbery, right? Just because you were there doesn't mean that you caused the crime. And essentially what this study is showing is all that it's showing is that you were there or all that it's showing is that erythritol was there. It is not proved that erythritol was the cause of the crime or erythritol was the cause of the severe cardiac event or cardiac disease. Another example could be smoke and fire. Smoke is present because of the fire, but the smoke is not the fire and the smoke did not cause the fire. It's there because the fire is there. Now, it's important to note that the people in the first part of this study, the greatest number of people that they followed over a period of about, I think it was three years, all of these people had significant higher risk of heart attack and many of them had already had a heart attack at one point. So these people were very sick already. So let's go back to point number two. Your body produces erythritol. Other studies have shown that when we are sick or stressed or experiencing some level of dis-ease, that our bodies actually produce more, higher levels of erythritol. So this goes back to our fire analogy. The smoke is there, but it's not necessarily the fire. In addition, these studies were not actually tracking dietary consumption of erythritol. It, they did not track whether or not any of these people actually consumed uh, foods that contain erythritol or were eating erythritol directly. They just took blood samples and, and they noticed, hey, there's more erythritol in their bloodstream. That's an important thing to, to point out because they weren't actually tracking, okay, that person ate erythritol and now it's causing heart disease. The study wasn't designed to actually do that. But some people are interpreting it that way and that's the problem. Now, the second part of the study did take 
a group, a very small group of people, I think it was eight people, where they actually were consuming very large amounts of erythritol daily. I think it was like 30 grams. That's a huge amount. And it did show that erythritol went up in their bloodstream. All that that shows is that when you eat something, there's more of that something in your body. I know that's an oversimplification, but you get the point. Okay, so let's go back to point number three. Erythritol has been mass produced since the 1990s. It's been in our food supply for more than 20 years. Now, I recognize that it's been much more popular in the last five to six years as low carb and ketogenic diets have increased in popularity and so many people have jumped on them. And there's a lot more consumption of erythritol. But my question is, where are the documented events? Where are the documented cases where people have taken erythritol or they've eaten, eaten a lot of erythritol products or products containing erythritol and have had a heart attack or have had a stroke? I'm very curious. I wonder if that data is out there. And I wonder if it is, why we haven't heard about it. That's just a question that sort of pops into my mind when I hear about this. And honestly, until I did the research, I didn't realize that erythritol is actually being mass produced for that amount of time. And when I saw that, I thought, wow, okay, well, where are the examples of people that have eaten erythritol and have had these kinds of major cardiac events. And let's revisit number four. There are many other studies that have shown that erythritol may actually be beneficial to overall cardiovascular health. This study doesn't automatically negate all of those studies, doesn't automatically mean that those studies are wrong. So it's really important, this is what people aren't really doing, it's really important to take all the information that we have available and approach this topic in the context of all the information that we have available. So I do think there's some both good and bad about this study. I don't think that it's necessarily a bad thing. What I think is bad is the way that people are interpreting it. Some of the good things that I see from this is that if this study, if this drama can, can fuel enough interest to, to do more studies, to do long-term studies that could help us answer some of these questions definitively, that could only be a good thing. In fact, in the abstract of this study, they actually say, you know, long-term, more long-term studies are warranted. They're actually kind of saying, hey, listen, this is what we found. This is what we see. We should do more long-term studies. And I don't think that's wrong. I think that would be awesome. I also think that it could be a very good reminder that anything in mass quantities, even though a little bit might be good, massive amounts of it may not be, you know, give you a positive result. On that note, there are cases where people have literally drank so much water that they've actually drowned themselves. They've actually died because they drank way too much water. It's, it's not, easy to do that. It's very rare, but it does happen. It's a perfect example of something very, very good for you, something needed actually, and taken to extreme cases or extreme quantities, you know, actually not being good for you. The bad things I've sort of already talked about already is that people are misinterpreting this study and sort of it is cause for widespread fear about something that is actually pretty good. I mean, erythritol is still a lot better option than sugar. We need more information, yes, but let's not take the information that we have and misinterpret it and use that to, you know, cause fear at large in the public. So what do we do? First of all, don't panic. And I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but I am gonna encourage you to go do some more research, but look at information that is being put out there by credible sources. And we'll get to more of that in just a minute. Again, I'm not gonna tell you what to do, but I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna worry about it. I'm not gonna avoid all products that contain erythritol. I'm not gonna avoid using erythritol in cooking or baking or anything like that. I am also probably gonna continue to recommend it as a healthy alternative. In addition, I will probably tell people, just don't overdo it. Don't eat mass quantities of erythritol on a daily basis. I'm also gonna recommend that if people already have a high risk of heart disease or have had a heart attack or that you find yourself in a situation where your health is such that you're concerned about this, go talk to your doctor. And you may consider not consuming, again, mass quantities of erythritol. So some other videos I want to recommend on this topic. Go look at Dr. Barry's video on this topic. Dr. Barry, <laughs> Dr. Barry does a very good job at breaking this down in a nose nonsense, very practical approach. I like that he gets, he's very sarcastic. I find that entertaining. And what the other thing that I really like about Dr. Barry is that he's not a big proponent of alternative sweeteners. And what I like about this video is that even he, not being a fan of alternative sweeteners, even he doesn't damn 
erythritol based on this study. Also, I would recommend Thomas DeLauer's video on this same topic. His whole channel, or a large part of his channel, is built on reviewing studies like this, breaking them down in ways that you and I can understand, and putting forth some very, very informative information. He gets really riled up about this. It's pretty entertaining, and you can see the passion in, in you know, what he's trying to do. It's also very, very informative. I would recommend that one as well. Another one I would recommend is go to High Intensity Health. Mike Mutzel does a good job at helping to disentangle the information in this study. I think you'll enjoy that. Another one I would recommend would be uh, the video on BioLane by Dr. Lane Norton. It has this down-to-earth way of explaining some of this high-level information for people like you and I. I found it very informative and helpful. Last but not least, uh, Slim Land does a video on this. A very nuts and bolts approach to explaining this. I haven't seen a lot of his content, but what I have seen is pretty good. So I think you'll enjoy that one as well. I think that dog back there is probably more dangerous than Rithritol.